Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's, this afternoon's discussion with His Excellency Dr. Didicus Jules, the Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States on the impact of the La Soufrière volcano in St. Vincent. My name is Patsy Lewis and I'm the Director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, CLACS, at the Watson Institute. CLACS is one of six centers located at the Institute, the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University, and is the oldest area study center at Brown. We are happy to co-host this event with the Watson Institute's Masters in Public Administration program. The MPA launched only six years ago is already ranked in the top 50 programs in US News graduate rankings. Watson also offers a joint master's in public administration and a master's in public health option with the School of Public Health. Today's symposium is one of the orientation events for the new cohort of MPA, MAPH students. I would like to express special thanks to Olivia Whelan, who is Associate Director of the MPA program for helping to organize and co-host this event with us. I also wish to thank Ellen White and John Massa from the Watson Communications team, as well as Clark Center Manager, Kate Goldman. I also would like to welcome, sorry, to thank Mrs. Lucy Jean Charles of the OECS, and of course, His Excellency, Dr. Didicus Jules for agreeing to join us today. Before we start, I'd give a brief introduction of Dr. Jules. Doc, His Excellency Dr. Didicus Jules assumed the post of Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States in May 2014. He is responsible for driving the regional integration thrust towards a single economic and social space involving 10 Eastern Caribbean states. Dr. Didicus Jules has had extensive regional and international experience. He served as Registrar and Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Examinations Council, leading a thorough modernization of the council. He also served as, as Vice President Human Resources with Cable and Wireless St. Lucia, Permanent Secretary for Education and Human Resource Development in St. Lucia, as well as Permanent Secretary for Education and Chief Education Officer in Grenada between 1981 and 1983, which I must um, acknowledge, full disclosure, that's the period during which I first met Dr. Jules. He, Dr. Jules has provided consultancy services to national governments, regional and international organizations in the Caribbean, Africa, Europe, and North America. He has also served on many private sectors, educational and philanthropic um, boards. Dr. Jules holds a BA honors from the University of the West Indies, KFL Barbados, and an MSc in curriculum and instruction and a PhD in educational policy and curriculum and instruction from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as an MBA from the University of the West Indies, KFL. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our audience, especially the students of the MPA program. And I, the format of, of the discussion is that um, Dr. Jules would give us um, an initial presentation, basically taking us through, helping us to understand what exactly happened in St. Vincent, you know, where the where St. Vincent is now with the volcano, what the effects have been on St. Vincent, as well as other countries in the region. And um, I will follow up with questions. So we'll have a conversation for the first half an hour or so, and then I'll open the um, floor for questions from the audience. You don't have to wait until we're finished to start fielding your questions in the chat function. So I, and Dr. Jules, I'm sure you will take the opportunity 
to explain what the OECS is um, to our audience. So um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Lewis, and thanks to your colleagues in the center for inviting me. It really is a pleasure to share with you the information that I have to give about the situation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, let, by way of explanation, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States actually celebrates its 40th anniversary on the 18th of June this year, a few days' time. Uh, we are an integration movement of actually now 11 member states, and at this meeting of the heads of government meeting, there will be a 12th member joining. We comprise six independent member states of the Eastern Caribbean. If you look at the chain of islands um, on the Caribbean map, starting from below Puerto Rico with um, the US, the British Virgin Islands, going all the way down to Grenada in the southernmost tip of that chain of islands, most of these islands are part of the OECS, except with the exception now of the Dutch speaking countries. So our objective is to have a seamless integration movement. Uh, establish a single economic space as well as a social space. Uh, six of the independent, six of the, the members are independent states. Six are British and French dependencies. So we have three independent states as part: Martinique, Guadeloupe, and Saint Martin. And um, we've been described as a more successful European Union. There's no Brexit, <laughs> and um, we are pushing ahead with the solidarity. I was saying to Professor Lewis earlier, sometimes what people see as being a disaster also carries within it great seeds of opportunity. And for us, every disaster is an, is an opportunity to restore our resilience, our determination to succeed, and to find opportunities for us to deepen our solidarity with each other. In the last 10 years, every disaster that has hit the Caribbean has taken us to a new plateau of solidarity. So I just want to get into a presentation. I will share my screen to just take you through what has happened in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, are you seeing my PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah, OK, let me go into presentation mode. OK, I think I have to, I have to invert, right? Um, I don't no, think so. Okay, I did the wrong thing. Yeah. Okay, so you see in the full slide presentation. Yes. Full page? Yeah, okay. So um, the information here gives you an update up to yesterday. And um, the last, the, what has happened is Sufre Volcano has been in St. Vincent from the time the island emerged from the ocean. And there have been several periodic um, eruptions. The most recent eruption happened a couple about a month ago, and there have been it was it was characterized by a series of of volcanic effusions, um, most of which, well, the country for some time they had been showing heightened activity because. Um, in, in modern times, that is from the 1970s, St. Vincent has maintained an active watch on the volcano, given the, the danger that it posed. Um, in, it is in the northern part of the island, and that happens to also be the agricultural belt, the, the major agricultural belt with a few villages um, in that location. But it started with some a growing of a dome in the crater of the of the volcano and um, the first the first set of eruptions started with pyroclastic flows of mud and then it became more violent with a huge explosion happening the last eruption happened in on the 22nd of april this year um, so this is a, a highlight of the impact of the of the volcano you can see in the picture here one of the most explosive um, eruptions that happened in this in this series, but uh, 24,651 people out of a population of about 120,000 roughly had to be were directly affected or displaced by the volcanic eruption. 30 villages had to be evacuated, 
Um, there were 84 public shelters initially established. And um, it, the persons in public shelters, government public shelters, were 4,339. You had 6,000 displaced households. Um, 21,000 of the, the affected persons were moved to private resident shelters. 4, 000, call it 5,000 of them were displaced vulnerable persons. Uh, almost 3,000 of them were elderly. Thankfully, there were no missing persons, no injured persons. There were no deaths or no medical evacuations required. And that is because the government, having kept a, wat a watch on what was happening, progressively escalated the alert um, from yellow to orange to not to, when it, when, it, when it reached a higher stage of orange alert, they ordered evacuation. So there was still an opportunity for people to safely evacuate the red zone and also the yellow, what we call the yellow zone, so that there were no, damp, no um, fatalities or um, injuries caused by the volcano. Um, they, in that region that had to be evacuated, there were 13 health facilities, two of which were hospitals. So as you can imagine, that also impacted the capacity of the country to address any potential health challenges that were faced. Now, the good news about this is that the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, from the time the volcano started showing early signs of reawakening, um, worked with the major disaster agencies, that is the Caribbean Public Health Agency, as well as the Caribbean um, Disaster Preparedness, um, Preparedness Agency, um, CEDEMA, to to have plans in place in order to deal with the situation. So for example, in the OECS, we were prepared to accept uh, approximately, approximately 12,000 of the evacuees because the carrying capacity of the country did not allow it in shelters to hold as many as 20 plus, 20,000 plus evacuees. Um, when the evacuation did happen, however, we found that many of the Vincentians were not willing to evacuate off, con off island. And that is understandable because if we put ourselves in a personal situation, I would not want to leave my country, even to go to a friendly neighbor, neighboring country. I would want to restart my life as, easy, as early as possible. And given the indeterminate um, predictions on what, how long this would last and what would be the ultimate impact, I think people wanted to sort of take it, rough it out, and see how best they can restore their lives and livelihood. So they, in the end, the government had to extend its, its um, facilities, and uh, we had to assist with bringing in supplies and um, temporary housing facilities, tents, and other resources in order to keep things going. Uh, the, there were 19, now all of this is happening at a time when COVID is, is running through the region as well. We've been impacted by COVID. So three of the isolation centers were also affected by this. The hospital bed capacity on the main island was 200. And in the Grenadines, there are about 30 islands associated with the state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. There were 20, uh, cap, the total bed capacity in the Grenadines was 21. Now, this happened at a time when we had 154 active COVID cases. And up to the 15th of May, with the, between evacuation and the need to ramp up the administration of vaccines in order to build some population immunity, up to 17,800 persons had been vaccinated. So, um, on the 6th of May, the National Emergency Management Organization lowered the volcanic loot from red, from red to orange. And with that, persons were asked from the orange and yellow zone residents to go look to begin to return home and begin cleaning up. And a two-week food package was provided to, to all families involved in that relo relocation. The commencement of our rainy season this month has pose serious threats also of volcanic mud flows. And in fact, to compound the crisis, um, just about 
two weeks ago there was a heavy there were heavy rains in um in St. Vincent and as a result of that the green zones which were the safe zones where most people were relocated were badly flooded so we had a combination of having to deal with a combination of COVID of the volcanic displacement and then with floods in the safe areas um, at the, the, the impact of the volcano has been felt very strongly in particular sectors. So in education, besides the impact of COVID on the fracturing of um, school attendance, we, many schools had to be closed for long periods of time. Face-to-face -face learning has been resumed for students who are expected to sit the Caribbean examinations, terminal examinations, and classes resumed as of the 17th of May. Now many schools are being used for public shelter. So the buildings, several buildings that are currently being used as learning hubs are now being used as learning hubs to facilitate the continuation of face-to-face -face learning um, so that because the schools in the safe zones are being used as public shelters. And the other students remain very dependent on virtual learning. So even students in the shelters. So we have been working with the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to provide additional devices, laptops, computers, um, working with the provide the internet providers to ensure that there's access to, adequate access to the internet. And a lot of support coming from UNICEF Barbados in the rollout of learning devices to ensure continuity of learning. The registration period for children entering government or own preschools and primary schools for the upcoming academic year has commenced as of the 1st of June. But, um, and the Caribbean Examinations Council has delayed examinations for, by two weeks in order to accommodate students in St. Vincent to do their catch-ups for the exams. The introduction of an informal learning program commenced on the, the 10th of May, actually called Growing Through the Ashes. And this is a program designed by teachers and education officers in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, supported by their counterparts in the rest of the OECS to address the learning needs from preschool to Form 5. Um, we've actually configured a piece of, of, of an application called OECS iLearn that works on laptops, devices, as well as mobiles, mobile phones, in order to ensure access to continuity of learning is available to everyone. And a blended program is now being implemented in the shelters that also includes provision of psychosocial support on Mondays and Wednesdays, and with the continuity of learning program being conducted on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. The, in agriculture, as I said, the volcano zone coincides with the, the rich agricultural belt of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And in fact, within the entire OECS, St. Vincent and the, Grenadines, and the Grenadines is one of the most dynamic spaces for agriculture. They have done the most in terms of food advancement on food security. They have been the leading country in the intra-OECS trade of agricultural products and produce. Um, and all of this now has been affected severely by the volcano. The reports from early May reveal that a third of the country's agricultural production has been wiped out and the agricultural losses range in, in the range of 150 to 175 million EC dollars, Eastern Caribbean dollars. The rate of exchange is, is roughly 2.7 to 1. In the red zone alone, which is the immediate um, concentric circle around the volcano, 100 per, all of the vegetable crops, 80% of the root crops, 65% of the arrowroot crops were destroyed. Arrowroot is a, is a tuber that is um, unique, well, very special to St. Vincent. St. Vincent is perhaps the largest producer of arrowroot in the world. And it is a very important ingredient in, um, in the feeding, um, the foods developed for baby, feeding of babies. Um, the, with the weight of the ash, the ash fall, 90% of tree crops have been damaged. And in the orange zone, which is the next concentric circle, 75% of agricultural production was destroyed. Fisheries were impacted also due to changes in water conditions because there's a lot of runoff 
of not just um, muddy water, but also ash, ash filled water, ash saturated water going into the near, zo near shore areas. So whatever reefs are there are being badly impacted and it is, you know, creating real stagnant conditions in the water. Um, the livestock and poultry, poultry very affected and killed. What prior to, once the, the alert had been given, efforts were made to relocate livestock, but the remaining, all livestock were actually just allowed to roam freely. So they found their way out of the danger zone. Animals have that instinct. Um, mud flows continue to be a major problem in the, much of the north, and it will be for several years, even when the volcano stops erupting. And roads that have been blocked at different times from the mud flow, in fact, in some cases, the roads have been completely destroyed. So there's a huge challenge there for infrastructure. On the, at the level in the area of food security, shelter, and livelihoods, um, most of the persons relocated from the red zones, mainly farmers, are not expected to leave their shelters anytime soon because out of an abundance of caution, even if the eruptions have subsided, the government will not allow relocation in the red zone until they are absolutely sure of the security um, for persons going back in. But that, however, con there's a continuing sense of worry among individuals returning to the orange and yellow zones, not so much because of the threat of new eruptions, but due to the destruction of jobs and the ash in um, public spaces. Vulnerable families need support with the restoration and cleaning of their homes. In many cases, roofs, roofs have collapsed from the weight of the ash. Um, walls have collapsed, so there has to be a whole reconstruction of villages in those areas. Government has provided some relief to farmers and others who have become unemployed in the red zone, or those who were formerly employed in the red zone, approximately 14,000 people, providing income support of between five and 400 EC dollars per month for the rest of the year. And there has been movement towards restoring tourism. Um, now that the volcanic effects have subsided, the government is beginning to, is beginning to start a gradual resumption of tourism, which is one of the major sectors. And um, the Sandals chain, which is the largest indigenous Caribbean chain of hotels, I'm sure many of you would have heard or seen Sandals ads. Um, has led a recruitment drive because they have they have started um, restoration of some of the hotels in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Sandals is making a major investment in that regard. So food packages, stipends, one-time disbursements are being provided to other affected groups living outside of the red zone. For persons who have been relocated in centers, they are being fed and sheltered there. For persons who are being sheltered with friends and family, support is also being given to them. So the socioeconomic impacts um, have been deemed to be very significant. Um, a regional CARICOM World Food Program survey in 2020 found that 60% of the respondents from St. Vincent and the Grenadines reported job or income loss in their household, and a third were eating less or skipping meals. Now that is just the impact of COVID on St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So you can imagine these statistics quoted here have been exponentially compounded by the impact of the volcano. In terms of resilience and recovery, the government of St. Vincent now continues to focus on phase one of its response, which is humanitarian response, provision of housing, clothing, and the feeding of evacuated citizens and have started now transitioning into the cleanup and reconstruction phase, um, which obviously will be necessary to bring some semblance of normality to the affected areas except for the red zone. Um, there is need for evacuation, um, for determination of the usefulness of trash in an economic and feasible manner for construction. Now this is where being part of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States is helpful to Dominica, to St. Vincent, because we have a coalition of over 150 international philanthropic bodies, private sector entities, um, civic organizations, environmental organizations who are all working 
to assist St. Vincent and the Grenadines in its medium to long-term recovery. The, if the, the emergency phase has been pretty well covered by the specialized Caribbean agencies who are designed to provide that support. But where the longer term support is going to be required and huge investment is going to be in the reconstruction and the, and the recovery, the recovery and reconstruction fees. So support needed for farmers in, um, in the building of capacity and production is moving forward with the provision of equipment and um, provision of strong technical advisory support and material support for the cleaning of fields as well as the receding of the restoration of farms. The water service has been restored in the bottom half of St. Vincent, and there will be need now for construction and engineering support to restore water catchments and to build more resilience going forward. There are huge opportunities in ecotourism and um, even some measure, some degree of volcanic tourism. Montserrat has, we've learned the lessons from Montserrat, which had a volcanic eruption about about 10 years ago. And um, all of that is going into the efforts, the plans for reconstruction. The World Food Program is supporting the nationally led response by lending its global logistics capability, including personnel, equipment, and transport. Um, there's the strengthening of data management through the digitization of government systems. So we are working, for example, with one of the one of the, the cloud centers to provide at no cost to the government a complete backup of all government records and, and services so that they, in the event of any further eruptions, there will be no loss of data necessary to provide seamless service to the, to the citizens. The World Bank has disbursed 20 million US dollars from a contingent credit line um, what is known as the catastrophic deferred drawdown option um, in order to aid the government of St. Vincent. PAHU has been providing healthcare facility visits and assessments during that period, during the, the, the early period of the, of the disruption. 30 facilities were visited, 26 of which were assessed, including four in the yellow zone and 22 in the green zone. The World Food Program and PAHU Logistics are supporting logistics and providing food vouchers, cash transfers to displaced healthcare workers and to vulnerable groups. Approximately 6.9 million US has been mobilized under the UN Global Funding Appeal to support St. Vincent. And um, the Food and Agriculture Organization has been providing breeding stock, seeds, planting material in order to support a rapid production, re re restart of the agricultural sector and has allocated 100,000 EC dollars to support, to provide feed for the livestock sector. The International Red Cross has distributed cleaning kits to families in private centers and continues hygiene support and COVID prevention messaging. So that essentially is the, um, is the situation as it now stands with St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And in terms of the OECS response, our focus is to bring together the sup consolidated support of all of the member states of the OECS in providing um, support in logistics. So we have been helping with the provision of fresh food and vegetables from the other islands of the OECS. We've done a tremendous amount of work in barging in water, huge quantities of water in the early stages of the of the disruption. Now, with the water supply being gradually restored in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are turning our attention to working with that international coalition I spoke about in order to ensure that St. Vincent has um, the support required, technical, material, and logistical support to begin its, its recovery. And we are very clear that this crisis has provided us with an opportunity not just to reconstruct, but to build back better. That is looking at green economy, the, uh, the blue economy, and ensuring that resilience of infrastructure um, is built into the modernization of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Jules. This was um, very informative. But I want you, can you give us a sense of scale? Um, St. Vincent is a small island. Um, can you give a sense of what this means? Have there been um, any assessments on the, on the, like a dollar value to the economic cost, for example? Um, you talk of most of the, the efforts at addressing um, the current situation is seem to be more immediate and short term and not sustain, you know, above over a longer term. I mean, for example, the one shot payments from government to families or even the payments from other international um, bodies. But you mentioned that this requires a longer term effort to, you know, at building back better, which didn't really happen in Grenada. It's a nice phrase, but it, you know, is never clear um, that it actually happens. And there's a big, one would imagine a big price tag. Who is going to be funding um, the reconstruction of St. Vincent's economy? Well, in the first instance, the first phase of the reconstruction starts with just simply trying to get livelihoods back in place. And that is why the, the resuscitation of agriculture, which I spoke to, is so important. So at least you get some um, restoring food security on the island, um, but also using that as an opportunity to begin to accelerate the intra-island the intra trade in agriculture and in other goods and services across the OECS. And that was why I said earlier that sometimes a crisis provides you with a unique opportunity. Um, we have been speaking for, the, for many years about the need to ensure that the OECS tr trade in the intra-OECS trade right now, um, uh, at least up to about two years ago, represented only about 1% of the trade, the collective trade of the OECS. And most of that trade is conducted between the OECS islands and, the, and Miami, Florida, in the, the US. So it means, therefore, that if we are going to talk about resilience and self-reliance and being able to be, to be on a sustainable development path, we do need to change, for example, our food import bill, which is um, well over $5 billion US dollars between the OECS islands and the United States that's as a principal source of food. And I mean, we are tropical islands, so we, it, you know, it's not... It, it just requires a very strategic and determined political and technical response to ensure that we are able to address that. Now, yes, um, it, building back better has been a phrase in the Caribbean, especially as hurricanes have become more and more disastrous. However, I think we are in very different times now because what we face before we had single disasters hitting us and then we try to re we recover from these. Now we have a convergence of disasters happening almost concurrently, so a concurrence of disasters. So while COVID is, is still impacting us, we've had the volcanic eruption in St. Vincent, while they were just getting the humanitarian response in place, the floods happened in the green zone. Um, now we're facing also an impending hurricane season that is predicted to be perhaps one of the most vigorous in recent times. So it, we have no choice now but to think strategically, to think of what building back better means and to do this. Now, on the international front, our heads of government and the OECS Commission has been very aggressive, arguing for pol what we call policy space. There is a need to, for example, with, in discussions with people like the IMF, the World Bank, to ensure that we take a serious look at what can be done to get these small islands to survive in this current environment? Um, it is going to mean that there has to be consideration of debt forgiveness, debt restructuring. There, and, I, and you should note that there has been great resistance in the multilaterals to the idea of debt forgiveness and less resistance to the idea of debt restructuring. But even then, we are saddled by policy restrictions that strangle us. So, for example, people are still assessing countries and determining eligibility for different types of concessionary aid 
based on your 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 GDP per capita. Now, I mean, when you when you look at COVID, the impact of COVID alone, our GDP has practically disappeared because we are among the ten most. The, many of the countries in the OECS are in the listing of the ten most tourism dependent economies in the world. Now. I guess for people living in bigger demographics like in the United States, when they hear 20,000 people displaced in, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, that sounds like nothing because 20,000 people in New York is not even a block. However, if you, put it, if you put it in the context of the scale of the island, evacuation of 20,000 people in, New, in, um, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines if that were to be scaled up to the context of, say, a city of 40 million people, would probably represent, um, that's 20,000 20, is a fifth of the population. So a fifth of 40 million is what would be evacuated had that happened in any geographic location with that size demographic. So, and that too is actually a, a sort of conceptual challenge for us in, in making our representation on the international stage. Because people think, in, they see the absolute numbers and they think in the absolute numbers, but they don't contextualize it in a small island space with a small demographic, what is the magnitude of that impact on lives and survival in these small states. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Jules. We have uh, quite a few questions. Um, two of which continue the discussion of the economy, but I'll hold off on these, um, come back to those later, and ask, Alexandra Johnson is asking what percentage of the island has been vaccinated? I know you gave the figure, but it went pretty quickly, and that would be help. And maybe you can talk more about what challenges there might be with getting people vaccinated, um, does St. Vincent and the Eastern Caribbean generally, or the broader Caribbean, have enough access to vaccines? Are people making use of the access where this, um, where they exist? Um, can you give us a, a, an idea of what that looks like? Well, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was one of the OECS member states that fed very well initially in the, at the, on the, from the outset of the pandemic. And um, you know the thing about Caribbean people, we tend to be complacent until we see, we feel the pain. So while there were warnings and you know the protocols were being put in place, people felt well we were relatively safe. Um, um, even up till recently, when the second wave started hitting the region, and that is when Saint Vincent started really experiencing what one would consider a really ser serious first wave. Um, now that has that has brought people's attention to the reality of the of the um, of the pandemic 17,800 persons as of the 15th of May have been vaccinated but with a population of approximately 120,000 and remember these have been I don't think that figure represents full vaccination it would be first phase vaccination first dose so we are a bit behind in in addressing that issue and that is not from want of access to vaccines in the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It is because there's a significant degree of vaccine hesitancy. Now at the OECS level, we actually will be launching in the next few days, a global camp. We're going to be at the spare tip of a global campaign addressing vaccine hesitancy that is going to be localized so that people get the message about why it is important to do so. We respect the fact that persons have choices, and I'm, I mean, constitutionally, our governments have been walking a very careful road between pushing people to get vaccines, trying to encourage them, and also um, bringing across the message of why it is imp so important to be vaccinated. Unfortunately, with the prevalence of social media and all of the hypotheses and theories or conspiracy theories around the vaccine, I think that is affecting people's perception of what needs to be done. It is only in those islands where you have had really large numbers of large 
numbers of deaths occurring from the illness, that you find people with that are taking the, the, the pandemic more seriously and looking at ramping up their vaccination rates. Um, we have been looking to at other solutions that have to do with improving the immunity response of individuals. So there, are, there is in Dominica a company that is producing a series of health products using natural herbs that is assisting with um, boosting the body's natural immune system. In Grenada, you have someone who has done work with a, a honey-based product that includes, it's an infusion of honey and traditional herbs that actually has been tested by the Harvard School of um, the Medical Facilities in Harvard. And they are beginning to, they, they, the early results are showing um, positive disposition to considering this a useful product to be used in building the natural immunity of the of the body. So we are we are looking at solutions like that also. Um, one of the things that we want to do with the natural products is to have a series of um, engagements, virtual engagements and face to face where possible with particular demographics that are very averse and resolutely opposed to the vaccine use. So for example, in the Rastafarian community, we are going to be engaging in dialogue with them on which natural herbs and products would help build immunity in given their reluctance to take the vaccine itself. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, Patsy, if I left out any, any um, part of it. I can respond. I think she's having um, some computer issues. Oh, she should be right back. Okay. But I don't know if you want to take a look at one of the questions in the chat. Another yeah, question. I noticed, chat. Yes, I noticed there's a question from Jose Jackson Malet, who's a, a Vincentian, I think he says, at um, Michigan State University. And the question is about the relocation of evacuees from the red zone says the news reports are that many are reluctant to return to the area for various reasons. Given the danger that is posed from the volcano and the damage caused, cause, what recommendations do you have for the government? Should they be asked to return or remain in the green zone? Okay, so this is a, a, a huge challenge for the government as well. Um, I can assure you that, um, and we have, I, let me first of all say that, you know, I'm not speaking as an outsider from the Vincentian situation, although I'm located in St. Lucia. Our, our heads of government have been meeting um, almost weekly in the early stages of this crisis in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, meeting with Prime Minister Gonzalez as well as different members of his cabinet in order to, you know, exchange information, dialogue, to get directly from them what are the most critical needs, what do we need to do to provide support, and that dialogue is ongoing. Um, we are in touch with the national emergency. So it's not just a political dialogue, it is also a technical dialogue. The, the challenge with um, the government asking people to return to the, to the orange zone, um, the red zone people, as far as I know, are not being asked to return to the red zone. In fact, in some, way, in some respects, um, re-entry into the red zone is still prohibited, notwithstanding the relative dormancy of the volcano at this stage. Um, but what is happening there is that persons from the, the other zones, certainly the yellow and the orange zone, are being encouraged to go back in on a limited basis to begin their own cleanup and restoration of their, of their, of their lives. Um, from the OECS end, what we've done is dialogue with the government. We are preparing, for example, to have a visit of um, uh, the infrastructure um, committee of the coalition that I spoke about, which involves a significant um, partnership with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and some of the large engineering firms within the U.S. who will come in and help do an assessment of the situation, the condition of housing. Um, they also is going to be in that party that will be visiting uh, um, a company that has a specialized arm that looks at the, pro the, con the, the production of co construction material using volcanic ash. So in fact, we, we are looking at an initiative 
that speaks to using ash, turning ash to cash, we call it, that would see to what extent can we make use of that, the tons of, hundreds of tons of volcanic ash that have been dumped by the volcano in order to create um, a, a construction industry in St. Vincent and the Grenadines that would also feed into the reconstruction um, opportunities. So yes, there is. this is not being taken lightly. Um, people are not being forced back into the, the, these zones, but they are being definitely being encouraged to begin to go in and start to look at the reconstruction um, and what needs to be done to help them get there. And thank you, Dedekos. Apologies, everyone. My electricity went and came back immediately and came back right after. So I just had to shut down computer and start all over again. I have consequently lost, I think, the earlier chat question. So I'll ask Kate to continue asking those. Well, I can pick up on one I see. Um, okay. Sure. Is asking whether the aid the aid is perceived as sufficient for rebuilding the country, or are there gaps where international organizations and other entities should be stepping up more? Definitely, I can say, and, and not just in the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in every disaster that has happened in the Caribbean in recent times, and certainly within the OECS, that is actually part of our strategic planning and logistics, that we are not going to be dependent on aid to do what we need to do. We are simply looking in the humanitarian phase of every disaster to draw as much support as is possible to make things happen. So for example, at the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Commission, we had set a target, and if you follow our social media or go on our website, www.oecs.int, you will see that the emergency response, we're trying to raise 100 million US dollars in cash support that would enable the government to, to, to jumpstart its efforts. But we are very clear that, and people of the Caribbean are very proud people too. And this is why um, we do not rely, believe that we should just be receivers of indefinite aid. And this is why, for example, even after the immediate evacuation, when we had made preparations for, tw for 12,000 persons from St. Vincent to be relocated, in other islands of the OECS, which being supported by friends, families, governments in the OECS. We had shelters established and ready in some of the islands to receive our sisters and brothers from St. Vincent. The Vences decided they were not going because they were just adamant. They would prefer to stick it out in the rough conditions in St. Vincent so that they can do what they could to restore their livelihoods. And I can understand that because if this happened in St. Lucia, I would not want to, as kind as um, the offer may be from others, friends and family and strangers in other islands in the Caribbean to house me indefinitely, I would not want to do that because they, if, it, if it were for a finite period, I know, okay, I'm only going for two weeks a month, then you can plan accordingly. But to be housed indefinitely in another island, you know, with the, supported by other persons, it does not do for your own sense of human dignity and your plans to get your life restored. So, so that, that there, there are going to be investment opportunities. Now, in the discussions we've had with the coalition, for example, we've, we've put certain very clear conditions on the assistance. We're saying, first of all, we welcome the humanitarian assistance. That's in that phase. As we go forward to the reconstruction, what we are looking for is um, knowledge, expertise, and investment. So, but we also clear that we did not want the humanitarian response to be a Trojan horse that would now see foreign companies and, um, and entities coming into St. Vincent and, and the Grenadines, assisting the, in the recovery in an investment capacity and end up dominating and owning the economy. So the idea was that whatever investment comes in to St. Vincent, and there are huge investment opportunities which the government is encouraging and we are promoting. That investment must also provide opportunity for the local private sectors, the regional private sector, and also the ordinary citizen to participate in the recovery. So for example, the credit union movement 
in the OECS is particularly strong. And in fact, in many respects, it is, it is, it is more reliable than the banking sector, the commercial banking sector, because this is where ordinary working people, poor people are able to bank their pennies to get assistance from when they need it. So, but the, the credit unions in the, in the OECS sit on a couple billion US dollars. And that money now sits in foreign banks being used for on lending for consumer, consumer goods, etc. And we at the OECS Commission have been strenuously advocating that we need to have a different regime with our credit unions where there's opportunity for them to get involved in major investments taking place in the islands. And St. Vincent, that situation in St. Vincent provides us with such an opportunity. So I spoke earlier, for example, about the interest of one company in assessing the, the, the ash to see whether it could be used for um, new construction material to replace cement, which is, by the way, very harmful to the environment. The, 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 the footprint for production of cement would really, if we were able to find an alternative that is greener, which the ash solution we are hoping will be, then it, it also addresses our commitments in the, in the COP arrangements, the COP treaties about, you know, cutting back on your carbon footprint. So we are looking for the opportunities for investment that would include participation of locals and of ordinary citizens in the process so that while we are building back stronger and better, greener, we are also having economic and financial inclusion of the wider population in that process. Thank you, Dr. Jules. We run out of time, but whew, okay, the questions are coming. So um, I will read them. Al Alanson Crookshank says he's from St. Vincent. And in terms of education and your experience with CXC, do you foresee any lasting effects of the adjustment in the Cape and CSEC exam form, exams format over the last two years? And Brian Meeks, I think somebody you might have a passing acquaintance with, is asking whether anyone is looking at the psychological impact of these disasters that can displace, as in St. Vincent, a fifth of the population. Is PTSD yeah. magnified when this is happening in such a small space. There are another, but we can start with this. Yeah, and let me just take these two quickly. Yeah, so to Brian's question, definitely. Um, in fact, we learned that lesson about the psychosocial impact from our early experience of the spate of hurricanes from Uma and Maria in, in the OECS, because a friend of mine, just to you know bring it down to a personal level, a friend of mine in Dominica was saying to me that every time her son has rain, heavy rain. He gets traumatized because he thinks it's another, this is like a five-year-old thinking that hurricane is coming and the experience was so traumatic. So what we did from the time, from since that five-year ex ago experience is that we have a working group in the education sector of psychologists and, um, and teachers and um, psychiatrists and so on from across the OECS as a virtual working group who provide that psychosocial support. What they do, they, they wherever a disaster happens, they actually fly in to provide that support. And, it's, and now with COVID, some of it is done remotely by using um, uh, online, online, um, online facilities. And um, so yes, there is a full program that has been designed for psychosocial support and it is being provided to the kids. Those who are in the, in the shelters in particular are uh, given, I think I mentioned in the presentation, two days of, of, of the week, of the working week, they are given psychosocial activities and support, and the other three days, they are, it's a continuity of learning. With respect to the examinations and CXC, this is something that has been, well, as you know, there's been a very active debate if you come from St. Vincent, person who asked that question. There's been a very active debate about the CXC response in the face of the crisis. And um, it's, 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 it's a textured debate because on the one hand, there are persons who are calling for 
literally dumbing down the exam in order to make sure that children get certified. And I don't think that that's a way to go. But there are also genuine concerns about um, what do you do in, with the fracture, the discontinuity of learning that has happened. Now, speaking as an educator, I've said to people, the biggest danger in this concatenation of crises that we face is not the lack of completion of a syllabus or whether we are able to do exams or not. The biggest danger is the impact of that on learning and the and the the, the 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 cognitive development of our students, especially the early learners. Now, I believe that we already have the opportunity in existing products of CXC to have a very, in fact, a world class approach to resolving this this dilemma, because, for example, you have the common entrance exam has is a is a very stressful one one shot exam. We've, CXC has developed a, 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 an alternative to that that works very well, that has actually, that actually is not a, a single do or die exam, but is a process involving um, learning, doing, learning, and assessing. And that it is formative assessment being used to improve learning, so, and, th and that is being documented through the process. So, the exam process is actually, how to put it, you can't differentiate the examination from the learning process because the two are being used to reinforce each other. I think that initiative provides us with a doorway to transform the other CXC examinations in a way that makes it possible for formative assessment to become part of the landscape of learning so that we will both improve learning accelerate learning, but also have psychometrically valid ways of giving certification. But that is for a discussion that will be taking place with the OECS Ministers of Education so that we can propose that solution to CXC. Okay, thank you. We're close to the end, but I'll try to bring the last two questions um, together. One is about the cannabis industry and why St. Vincent is not making more use of opportunities for investment in that area. And this person would love to discuss investment in cannabis, but there's no one to contact. That's Finkel Gilbert Dashant. And mm -hmm. there is a question from C. Constant about what you can learn from uh, Montserrat's experience in terms of uh, rehabilitating the agricultural sector. And if you can speak to more plan, specific plan to help this sector? And also, how are you going to ensure that there's an equal distribution of, of, her, of volcano relief um, in a highly politically polarized um, environment in St. Vincent? And that, that brings me to a final you know, wrap-up question, is we have focused a lot on hurricanes as the main um, threat to the region. But if you look closely, you'd see that the region is very susceptible to volcanoes. Mm -hmm. And what, what is in place regionally to address, to have a, 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 you know, a more far reaching perspective on the threat that volcanoes pose and how the region plans to address these as they come up? As a, as a more endemic problem for the region. Okay, so your last question first. Um, it means strengthening the, the disaster response mechanisms. And the disaster response mechanisms, because of the, the, the diversity of disasters that we are confronted with, and um, CEDEMA is at the focal point of that, the Caribbean um, disaster response mechanism. However, CDEMA does not just look at hurricanes. They've, they've come to the to public consciousness because of their very active role in the last the early set of hurricanes at Uma Maria. But in the volcanic situation, they've been active. So it is a question of us looking at how can we upscale those agencies to give them the resources required in order to play a much more dynamic role. And that has been something that we have been working on. So for example, 
the OECS Commission's role in these disasters has not been a lead role. It has been a role of backup support. So we use our diplomatic links, our relations with development partners and so on to help provide the support needed. We use our the fact that we are in, at the apex of the integration movement to draw on pull expertise from all across the OECS in whatever area of need there is so that we have our own people you know, providing the expertise required alongside the international support that we get. We, um, so so the, the, on, on the cannabis point with St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Vincent actually was the leading country in the OECS on the cannabis front. They have done the most research. They've, they had put in facilities in place. They've passed legislation. They've done, um, for example, made changes to, the, to the, the, the legal record of persons who were on minor charges of cannabis. They've decriminalized. So a lot has been done. And in fact, just last week, I had a discussion with the Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Saboto Caesar, saying, boy, lamenting that all of that work has been destroyed by the volcano because they actually had physical facilities in place that would involve, involve for, for use in research on cannabis and so on. And cannabis products were actually being um, prototyped in these facilities. And interestingly, his response to me is, yes, well, yes, we've lost everything. However, the most valuable thing we've not lost, and that is the knowledge and the experience. And that it enables us now to start back with on a, on a faster footing with better experience. And I think that is instructive because it tells you something about the mindset at work in that sector. So um, I am hopeful that, that the, cannabis, um, the cannabis industry in St. Vincent will pick up very fast. In the longer term perspective, St. Vincent will be better off. I was even jokingly saying to Minister Caesar, you better start um, copywriting a brand and call it um, Vinci Volca Volcanic Weed or something. Because, because it is a fact that after, once the volcanic ash um, is, you know, is purged of its caustic qualities and so on, you've seen boost in agricultural production once it gets you know, properly tilled into the soil and everything. So we're hoping that St. Vincent will actually be boosted in the coming years as an agricultural breadbasket. Barbados will also benefit because they, they got a substantial downfall of ash as well. What were the other two questions that you had asked quickly? And um, one question was about um, what we can learn from Montserrat for the agricultural sector and how do you um, circumvent um, the deep, in well, political fissures in St. Vincent okay. to ensure so that it's quality. The lessons from Montserrat, in fact, um, have been incorporated into the, the programs and the initiatives that we're doing for the recovery and the response in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I mentioned earlier that um, we've had, we, have, we have working groups of different kinds um, involving the best expertise in that area from across the OECS. So the persons from who, have been at, who are at the core of the recovery of Montserrat are actively involved with SEDEMA and with St. Vincent and the Grenadines in helping them assimilate those lessons and chart the way forward. So that, that is not a problem. Um, the, what the agricultural impact of the ash that I spoke about earlier is in fact a lesson learned from, 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 um, from Montserrat because Montserrat's recovery, you know, it's the soil, the, the soil texture and everything has been enriched. On the political front, that continues to be a challenge because frankly, in many of the islands, the politics is very deeply polarized. And I think the, our, our politicians need to understand that they are in times of crisis, times of crisis are not moments for political, um, political sparring. That like it, like them or love them, the government of the day is the government of the day. And there has to be a convergence of effort around what has to be done to save the nation. And this is the message that we've been pushing at the OECS. Um, in fact, we have coming up 
Um, I think it is on the 16th of June, and I would encourage all of you to log in, follow our website and log in. The OECS Assembly is going to be convened. Now, the OECS Assembly brings together not governments of the region, but the parliaments of the region. So, for example, in, from every, we, people attend the assembly as a national delegation, and the, the composition of that delegation is in proportion to the, the, the representation in the national parliament of government and opposition. And it had, we, are, we are looking now to build the assembly into a much more dynamic political space where we can have initially agreements on regional integration initiatives that we hope will impact the national political space. Because I have seen the last two assemblies we had pre-COVID in an Antigua and Barbuda is the seat of the assembly. You had government and opposition people sitting together and even in the, the waiting room prior to the, 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 the call for the start of the assembly discussing issues and so on. And it was amazing that outside of the national space, people can dialogue in that way. Well, that needs to continue into the, into the national space. So we're very hopeful about that. But um, it does take an exercise of responsibility and I think a call out where people are not um, using issues that um, are, are trying to make political capital out of things that really should be national challenges that require national responses. And the challenge is to both governments to, to take the high road of ensuring that they invite and engage the opposition perspective and for the opposition not to score, seek to score cheap political points. Okay, we have gone over our time by um, eight minutes. Um, so I'm happy and grateful that Ellen and John and Kate have borne with us, as have you, um, Dr. Jules. Um, if you'd like to make one comment before we close, um, I'm offering you that opportunity. Well, given, given the nature of this um, institute, my last comment would be to encourage people to sign up on the OECS, and I'm shamelessly pitching because I think that's, if you're really interested in the Caribbean, Caribbean development, um, international relations and the Caribbean dynamic, sign up on our website. You can, you will get fortnightly updates on all what is happening in the OECS. There's a tremendous amount of work being done on um, the green, blue, orange economy, on resilience, on infrastructure building, on climate change that I think you will find useful, and on youth, 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 gender, and disability are three critical cross-cutting demographics for us in the work that we do. So I encourage you to you know, sign up. If you don't like it, you don't, uh, you don't need to follow us, but I'm sure you will find it have useful and interesting what we're doing. And we welcome critical feedback and suggestions and recommendations coming from the audiences that we engage with. Thank you very much, Dr. Jules. Uh, this was a really interesting um, conversation. Um, thanks to all of you for staying. 